with my mother and me and then spin me around till I fell asleep then up the stairs he would carry me and I knew for sure I was loved if I could get another chance one final walk one final dance with him i play your song they would never ever end how i love
First of all, on behalf of my family, thank you all very much for coming to support us at this time. Many of you have come a considerable distance just to be here, and your presence means such a lot. Today, you will join me in that what only is the pinnacle of a so far short-lived profession, but what, what is also the single most greatest honour and privilege I've ever had in my whole entire life. This ceremony has been planned with much love by myself and my dad, Michael Lowther. And you should know that everything set today comes from the both of us. Because I know he's always with me in everything I do. So for those who didn't know, I'm Jack. <laughs> I'm a funeral celebrant. And I'm here today to lead you through the celebration of my dad's life. People often say, how are you going to manage Dean Young Father's funeral where he won't be at my wedding, he won't be at my stag do, he won't be at any of all losers' weddings, <laughs> or any of all losers' stag do's. So I think it's only right that I play my part here today. Firstly, before I start, not only do I look like me fella, but I talk like him now. <laughs> so I hope you've got your flight socks on. <laughs> my dad, Michael Peter Lowther, was born in the Princess Mary's Hospital, Newcastle, on the 12th of November, 1963, to parents Peter and Doris. Peter left when my dad was only two years old and he was raised as an only child in the same house as his mum, Doris, and his two grandparents, Reenie and Jack, who he also happened to call mum and dad, as Doris was always busy working to provide for the family. It wasn't a conventional upbringing, however my dad wouldn't have changed it for the world. He always saw it as a gain, rather than a loss. He'd often tell tales about growing up on Time Bank. Memories of having his long hair dried and brushed in front of the fire on a Sunday night. Memories which didn't last long, as my dad soon put a stop to it after my nana Rini found a pack of tabs shoved in the back of his pants. <laughs> It was these times in Time Bank which forged the family orientated, happy go lucky, and endearing character that everyone grew to love. My dad was a brilliant footballer, and as a kid, he had trials for Middlesbrough. But the biggest overriding passion in my dad's life was music. Thankfully, music is something which never left my dad's side right up until the end. My dad attended Bladen West School and then Bladen Comp and although he was quite intelligent, he never really got the credit he deserves as he never really applied himself. He later come to claim that he studied at the University of Life. And it was here where he grew into his rebellious nature, and he hated getting his hair cut. Recently, a man approached my dad in the turf, and he began to explain how he used to get picked on at school, and that my dad always used to stick up for him. And this bloke must have been about six foot five, so obviously my dad went, I'm pleased I fucking did now. <laughs> A lady I've spoken to lately had said my dad was one of the best looking lads she'd ever seen in school. 
but he was never an arsehole. Sometimes it can be put just as simple as that. My dad left school with no qualifications, believe it or not, but that didn't stop him from telling me mum that he had five O levels. <laughs> of course, that didn't matter to me mum, because you don't need any qualifications to be the hardest worker she was ever laid her eyes on. A work ethic instilled in him by his mother, your grandma Doris, who herself has only recently retired last year, aged 83. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> your dad would go out drinking to his favorite place, the Mayfair. Then at 11 o'clock, when the drinking had finished, he'd camp out in town overnight just to ensure his place at the front of the queue to get tickets for his favourite bands such as Rainbow, Motorhead and Van Halen. Michael Schenker, the guitarist from UFO, was my dad's hero along with his football and idol Super Mac when he'd tell us stories of his bandy legs, his lightning pace and his missing front teeth. Heroes of course that came a distant second to his real hero, his dad, Jack. Unfortunately, I never met Jack, but I felt like I did in so many ways. My dad spoke of him in such high regard, but in knowing my dad, I did meet him. Through the influences that he's played on us, and the special part that my dad has played in my life growing up. Jack died when my dad was 16 years old, a week before he started work. My dad recalled the day well, as he never fulfilled his promise of getting him a bottle of Brunel out of his first pay packet. Upon leaving school at 16, my dad headed straight up the street to celebrate when the manager of the Queen's was astounded to learn the reason of him being out and that it was his leave as due, as he'd been playing for the darts team for the two years previous. <laughs> Mida was good at anything he turned his hand to, be it football, darts, pool, karate, talking, but the most significant conversation that ever took place was when he met his world, me mam, Anne. The first caught eyes on the bus from Bladen to town for a night out. And then coincidentally, they were on the same bus home. Not a coincidence. <laughs> Thinks I'm daft. I've only just plenty just dropped there. The last bus home from town being the highlight of the night for many people. The journey continued as my dad piggybacked my mum up Bladen Bank, which resulted in a split in a skirt. <laughs> my mum and dad got married at St Joseph's Church, Bladen, on the 24th of December 1988, with my mum figuring you'd never forget the anniversary with it being on Christmas Eve, which of course he never did, apart from one year he gave her a birthday card. <laughs> Sorry. Then after marriage came a great our responsibility, and my dad's life changed forever. On the 5th of February, 1992, someone came into my dad's life who gave him a sense of purpose and a sense of responsibility. Someone who he adored, someone who he loved, and someone who I know he was so proud of. Kevin Keegan was appointed as manager <laughs> of Newcastle United Football Club, which just so happened to be my birthday. 
Fortunately for him, I was a little twat. <laughs> My dad actually wanted to call us Kevin Keegan Lowther. <laughs> and actually Kevin Keegan Gilfillan at school had it. I was gutted. <laughs> but after much deliberation, they went with the name Jack. My brother Lewis was then born on the 22nd of May, 1995. And this completed the family that my dad worshipped. Nicky's favourite subject has always been Mickey. <laughs> Thanks, Uncle Ed. <laughs> but in time, it soon became Anne, Jack, and Lewis. He was completely devoted to her, and we were all he'd ever talked about. <clears throat> Mind, growing up, all my dad would ever talk about to me was David Trinola. My dad tried everything he could to get us into football and I'm so pleased that he did. My dad, as you know, was too daft. And he'd always talk about the time Ginola destroyed Neil Cox playing for Middlesbrough. And I could hear, hear the excitement in his voice as I imagined every nutmeg in my head. So much so that by the time it was 1998, he was devastated to learn I was a Tottenham Hotspur supporter. <laughs> But that was typical of the relationship I had with me dad. He was always up against it. But then he brought me, bought me my first season ticket and introduced me to my one true love, Newcastle United. The FA Cup semi-final at Cardiff, all of Shiraz goals, and many away days being standout memories. Again, Whenever I hear local hero or an old chant at the match, my dad will always come to the forefront of my mind. Then there were the times I'd try and play football too. As my dad would put it, I couldn't hit a cow's arse with a banjo. So, after many long nights playing football with us on Tommy's field, he eventually had his plane for the county, the district, some football teams that were way above my age group, and I was winning some trophies as well. And that was all down to the dedication and commitment of my dad. Lewis always recalls his first pint in tune when my dad took him to see his favourite band, UFO, with my dad's good pal, Eddie Burden. Lewis's second night in the tune was in the same venue, however he left in a wheelchair <laughs> after he drank a neat bottle of vodka. My dad got the call to go and pick him up, foreman. When he got there, he was desperately shoving his fingers down his throat as he heard how horrendous it was getting his stomach pumped. But thankfully, they swerved it. Lewis was heavily influenced by my dad's music and the rock and roll lifestyle. And he himself took up to learn the guitar, just like my dad did. And they also shared a keen passion for cars. My dad's first job, age 16, was at Beverage Printers. And it was here where he grafted for the remainder of his working life, as his other projects ran alongside. He bought the business, age 36, and he made a real success of it. If truth be told, printing was his only job, as the funeral industry and helping people was his passion. He'd slog his guts out from morning till night, every day in that factory, where the walls are still donned with pictures of me, me mum, and Lewis, and then of course Keegan's entertainers, Tino, Sulez, and Pedro. His sole motivation every day to get through every working day. He'd come home knackered, freezing, starving, have his tea, 
go to bed, start again the next day. When it came to spending money on himself, he was tighter than two coats of paint. <laughs> but with us, he couldn't be more generous. He's taken us all over the world, and I've got memories like you wouldn't believe. And also, we were never far from a disaster on holiday. My dad often called them with the Griswolds, <laughs> off National Lampoon vacation. He was a very affectionate bloke. And he would never get into bed without giving you a hug or a kiss. And still to this day, the smell of fresh ink will always be my favourite smell. If ever there was an analogy to describe how hard my dad worked, then let it be this. <laughs> and this came from the man himself when he rang us last week. He said, do you know what it is, son? When your dad played left wing for the school, I played left back, so I know how hard he walked. <laughs> and that was from Davy Watson. <laughs> so thanks, Davy. Everyone has a Mickey Lowther tale. From his days playing football, when he'd get out his BMW with just his wife and son and gone, I knew I'd forgotten something. <laughs> to the times he'd poke his tadger through a hole in his towel and begin to dry his face, which would then cause his tackle to swing, the quick eye he dried. He'd always read stories to us with his hands when he spoke. Not to mention the time playing football when he ran 45 yards just to land a punch on an opposition player who'd gotten into bother with the late Frankie Morgan. Frankie Morgan, for anyone who doesn't know, was an elderly gentleman who had watched the local football on weekends and on this occasion he got involved with a ruckus and he was hitting people with his stick and obviously my father couldn't help himself. My dad played for many win Leighton teams over the years and he was also proud of his involvement in setting up the Huntsman football team. The most, the most important comments to me, although a standout footballer, was that he always made people feel a part of it. He created camaraderie, which in turn built brilliant atmospheres, which in turn built successful football teams. And he did this with every changing room he walked into, whether he was the captain or not. And that's what Sunday mornings were all about. Crack with the lads and the escapism from the everyday stresses of life, while looking cool the whole while doing it. Business was non-stop. He was a self-made man that had come from nothing. And he was always very proud of his working class background. His success meant he was able to buy a holiday home in Lanzarote, where he was fortunate enough to make a fantastic network of friends. Friends who are currently watching out in Treat Bar. Hola. <laughs> As my father would say. Well, I'll eat if you're feeling Julie. My dad couldn't even rest when on holiday. As often my mum would dupe him and tell them it was 10 in the morning, when in fact it was only 7. And the neighbours would be astounded to see him up so early doing the varnishing. Thankfully, my Auntie Linda was there to put him right. Cheers, Auntie Linda. But his favourite thing to do in Lanzarote was lie back on his balcony on the night time and watch the stars. In his later years, my dad's career took an unexpected turn as he got a part-time role working for a national corporate funeral company, who he banned our dad from talking about as he was so obsessed with working there. What well, actually referred to it as the C word. <laughs> Not to be confused with the word my dad often used. 
when calling people that got on his nerves. That was me fella. He was always honest, straight as a die, and he never suffered fools. On the whole though, his experience working down there as well, it was a great experience and it was all he ever spoke about. He made some amazing friends when learning the trade, and particularly his former colleague Jason, who has grown to be part of our family, and who I hope will remain a part of our family in the many years to come. My dad got great job satisfaction from helping people in the most difficult and most challenging time of their lives. And again, he enjoyed the camaraderie with all his colleagues because he's always a great believer in a happy team is a winning team. And in this line of work especially, everyone needs a Mickey Lowther. I do. My dad was massively popular when he worked there with the staff and with all the clients he had to deal with, many of whom have sent their heartfelt condol condolences. Sorry, I put my teeth in. There was always people coming in asking if Mickey Lowther could do their funeral. Then more or less, before every funeral, there was a running joke as to how many people recognised him from the congregation. The murmurs soon started. Ho oh, Mick, hi Mickey, how are you Mick, ho oh, Mick, hi Mick. Eventually, the penny dropped and my dad began to realise that there was a future here for both of his children. My dad had found his vocation in life and with this in mind, he decided to set up a legacy for myself and for my brother. My dad set up Lowther Funeral Services situated at 8 Barmore Terrace, Wrighton, NA40, <laughs> 3BB, 0191, 447, 1450. That's 0191, 447, 1450. That's come from me father. When the business started, you would have thought he'd won the lottery. Graft and his family, all under one roof. Way. <laughs> what can I say about working with me dad? He made you laugh every day, whether it be intentional or unintentional. He had a day-to-day -day enthusiasm for life that was unparalleled. He loved people, and he loved to talk, and he loved telling people his jokes, jokes that only he could tell. The Ashton jokes, being a particular favourite of mine. But he had a knack of always being able to make you laugh and make you feel good. A five minute job would always take an hour because he took so much pride in caring his work or he was gassing. But to me, he was the Geordie Dell boy. He never switched off. He had this idea that in time, the roundabout at Bladen, where we'll have our advertising boards, would be referred to as the Lowther's Roundabout. <laughs> Just like the Rex Bank, where the bingo hall once stood, I used to wince at visions of me dad stopping to give people directions just so he could say, can't allow this wrong about. <laughs> Cause he was. <laughs> Honestly, he'd never, ever miss a trick. He was a happy-go-lucky risk taker. He was eager, he was in your face. There was nothing subtle about him. He had a loud dress sense but even louder haircuts. And I think the whole of Lanzarote can vouch for his little skin-tight red speedos. <laughs> he went on holiday in Spain and he looked more Spanish than the Spanish. 
And he also never fa- sorry, also he never failed to try and adapt to the new cultures and the different ways of life. Like the time in America when he'd go up to people and go, ha. <laughs> I go, what are you doing? We don't understand, are you? <laughs> ha. <laughs> and of course, with every Dell boy, there's a Rodney Trotter. <laughs> you once bought us these giant brush aprons for me to wear to wash the cars in. I mean, look at these, walking around in one of them. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Thankfully, Joe Lockie did it instead. <laughs> and the number of times He'd spin a story to manipulate us into doing something I never wanted to do it was unreal. Many a time at Yarram tried to force my services onto new fu funeral directors when I was just new to me role. And I wanted to gain some experience first before I took on lots of work. Quality over quantity. But whenever my back was turned, <laughs> My dad would be out in his spare time pimping us out <laughs> to any director that would listen. He'd always overplay it, telling them I was the best in the business and he's just what you're looking for, oblivious to the fact I can hear him through the wall. <laughs> and he'd come through, this funeral director, he's been looking for a young male celebrant with a Geordie accent. I says, that's convenient. <laughs> I says, he's looking for someone with big lugs and all. <laughs> so I've just heard everything next door, man. <laughs> Think I'm stupid? <laughs> he really loved being part of this community. I still remember the spring in his step when Father Adrian knew his name after getting blessed during communion. The things my dad put himself through towards the end were incomprehensible. When we were told my dad had six to 12 weeks left to live, the oncologist went on to explain that she'd expect him to be bedridden, not my dad. My dad was on Kielda enjoying a weekend away with his family didn't have sugar for over a year because he heard it fed cancer. And for a man who wasn't a big drinker, puddings and chocolate were his vice, especially if they were made by my mother. He did an alkaline diet. He didn't drink alcohol. He did painstaking physio twice a week. And he consumed so much cannabis that when they cremate his body later, Wait, I think the whole of Stanley and surrounding areas <laughs> will be higher than a mountain goes. <laughs> but to be honest with you, my dad would love the fact that if they were stoned and laughing, he was doing it, making them laugh, even after he was gone. If anyone wants to lift later, I'm doing lifts to Stanley with three o'clock. The oncologist had said my dad had been clinging on by his fingernails with such determination to stay with us that unfortunately he had to let go. He gave it everything, like he has done with everything in his life. He never done things by halves. Something wasn't worth doing if you weren't going to do it properly. He was brave, he was courageous, and he was ambitious until the very end. It's like what Mickey Langstaff used to always tell him, there's no fear in steady men. I remember coming home one day, rightfully expecting me dad 
to be in bed as it was my job to get him up. I was met with the sight of him sitting there watching the telly in his chair with nout on, furniture skittled everywhere from the route he'd chosen to take. It was like living in an episode of Little Britain. It was that fierce steeliness that always got him to where he wanted to be, no matter how many knocks he took along the way. I have reminded us of my dad everywhere. I go cycling to clear my head. I still can't manage to escape him. Last week, I cycled past the town and I seen the fog roll in and all I heard was sitting in the sea, sea, shot boss looking, sick of off his rolls. Slipping down slowly, slipping down sideways. I think I'll sign on the door. The tumour which grew on my dad's brain sadly affected his ability to walk and his ability to speak. But the part of the brain which stores music was not affected, which meant towards the end of his life, although my dad couldn't talk, he could do only three things. He could see Anne, he could swear, <laughs> and he could sing. Sometimes, in a desperate attempt to hear his voice, I'd stretch his aching muscles just so he'd go, fucking hell. <laughs> However, I will say this, he did get to tell us all that he loved us one last time. But, before my dad passed away, we were playing music for him to listen to in the shower, waiting in the hope of a miracle that he would somehow make a recovery and that music would aid his speech. I hadn't heard my dad speak in so long and suddenly he belts out a few lines from his song. And it was the same feeling I got when I watched him learn to walk again after his operation. And quite poetically, not only were the last words I heard from my dad through music, but the lyrics are a true reflection on not, not, on not only how I feel, but how I'm assuming a lot of people feel. My dad was the one that taught me that music can make you feel things that words just can't do alone. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Gail to the lectern, who's agreed to sing for what today. Oh my God, no, I'm not. <laughs> Ain't no love in the heart of the city. Ain't no love in the heart of town. Ain't no love and it sure is a pity. Ain't no love cause you ain't around. <sighs> yeah, I think I could do that. <laughs> My dad was hard as nails but soft as clots. He was five foot seven, but larger than life. I'm gonna miss him for the rest of mine. You're coming up, man. And so we've now come to the final act of part. Can you please stand if you are able? With love and appreciation, we commit the body of Michael Lowther to its end with nature. Rejoice that he lived, that you took delight in his friendship and love. Treasure the joy 
that you shared my dad's life with us. Cherish your memories of him. With love, leave him in peace. With respect, bid him farewell. Please remain standing for the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Please be seated. As long as we have music, then we'll always have me dad. Because no matter who you are, or where you are in the world, music will always bring him back, just as if he'd never been away. This next song was chosen by me dad, and it's dedicated to his world, my mum, Anne. Like you always said, music can make you feel things that words just can't alone. So this is from his favourite band to his favourite person. We'll now have a moment of reflection with this next piece of music.
To me, my dad is everywhere in what I hear, feel and see. Throughout delivering this service, he's standing here with me. I see him in the mirror. We all have the same blue eyes. And I see him playing football as I run with his calves and thighs. I can see him in war kid when he's talking with his hands or when he's speeding in his Mazda, music blasting from rock bands. I can see him in the strength of me mam, despite her heartache and her strife at the thought of moving on ahead without the love of our life. I see him every day at work, when at funerals, dressed in black. I hear him when someone says me name, reminded of his hero, his dad, Jack. He loved me grandma Doris, and he loved me Ganny Beat. <laughs> and he loved it when my granddad John sat and rubbed his feet. I miss him when I'm at the match but I'll try not to feel doom although it's not always possible and you're following the tune we loved your dodgy haircuts we'd laugh till we got a stitch especially when you called that wife a horrible fat bitch <laughs> and just as we stopped laughing and our sides had started healing. You'd go and do something stupid, like slip and come through the ceiling. We bought a dog named Bo for you. I think one of us lost our penka because we went and got another one. We've called him Little Shenka. <laughs> I miss you, Dad, forever. Having a laugh and taking the piss. The thing I'll always long the most is one last hug or one last kiss. I always try and summarise a person in three words at the end of a service. And when I sat and thought, I heard a voice say, give your mum some credit. Now I know that's five words, but it was Mickey Lowther who was telling us. <laughs> I remember watching 
as my dad took the stage at the Holgoth Club to thank Wallace for such an amazing 40th birthday party. And my dad wouldn't have had it any other way. It was typical of the man who referred to my mother as my world. Well, here it is. Astonishing, incredible, remarkable. During this last 12 months, I've watched while you've single-handedly played the role of both parents to myself and Lewis, which are now is never easy. <laughs> you've looked after both your parents, assisting with their day-to-day -day worries and helping them, which has been reciprocated by my grandma, who was doing every big and day, helping with the washing. You've played the role of both daughter and daughter-in-law to my grandma Doris, who's dealing with the heartbreak of losing her only son, which again is never easy. You've single-handedly ran both the funeral business and the printing business while it was still open when my dad was receiving treatment. The way you've balanced all those things and then more while, take, while taking care of me dad and adapting to your new way of life, although painful, has been nothing short of awe-inspiring. The only feeling I have when I stand here looking at you is total respect, pride and admiration at the fact that you're my mum. And I hold you in the same esteem as I hold me dad. My dad was totally besotted with you, and I know you were with him. <laughs> he may not have a voice anymore, but please may I ask that he can rely on you to help, help express his gratitude for everything my mum has done, not only this last 12 months, but from that moment they glanced eyes on each other on that bus all those years ago by joining me in a rapturous round of applause. Please, can I also extend my appreciation to my Auntie Ali, Auntie Jan, and Uncle Joe, who've stepped up enormously, not only as staff, but as family. My Auntie Ali doesn't know this, but me and Lewis call her Muhammad Ali. <laughs> for all the fights she's come and doing with and involving herself with. I've just been there with some of, some of the most intimate and beautiful moments I've had with me dad this last year. To me grandma Doris, for raising such a respectable gentleman. To me auntie Alice, for taking care of me grandma Doris. To everyone who represents now their funeral services. To everyone in my profession. To the amazing Gail, the singer. To Jason, who's been there for us no matter what. To all the staff at Mount Set, particularly the manager Michael, who's been a massive support to me ma'am. To Michael at Aztec Print, who made them order of services. To Kerry, Ian and the staff at the QA, who took such good care of me dad. To Nicola and Mark the Treasured Memories. I'd like to thank everyone in the Wide Awake Club, and with the captain's permission, I'd like to join the club in place of me dad and offer my way in any support possible. And to Barry and Christine Collins and their amazing family for giving us hope when there was none. You've been a light on a very dark journey. And as far as I'm concerned, 
I'll consider you both as family for the rest of my life. And to every, anyone who's interested in alternative medicines, in confidence, feel free to message me anytime. It didn't work for me, Dad, but it works for many people, so don't be shy. But now, finally, to all you. The way you've held yourself as a man and as, a, and as an individual over the past few months puts men to shame. The maturity and strength you've shown for me and my mum has been nothing short of unreal. You see it how it is. You never shy away from anything. You're honest, you're hard working, and the amount of respect I have for you is immeasurable. When my dad passed away, he didn't hesitate. He went straight to hospital. And with the help of our good friend Ian, who works at the QA, he washed me dad, he clothed me dad, and to me, it was as if he'd held him by the hand and walked him into that room for me from heaven for one last time. I thought he was gonna open his eyes and gonna yarry sunshine. It is without doubt the greatest gift I've ever been given. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart so very much. To me, Daft. <laughs> the bond I had with me dad is very special. He brought joy, happiness and laughter to so many people. They say, the two most important days in a man's life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. And thanks to me dad and to me mum and to Lewis, I feel like I know why. If I can make others feel the way Lewis made me feel that day and I got to spend another whole day with me dad, then this job is an absolute privilege. And it's an opportunity I'll always be grateful for both my mum and me dad. Me dad was perfectly suited to the job, was complimented, was warm, considerate and beautifully unique personality. I'm going to miss him massively. But it's quickly followed by the realisation that the hopes and dreams of me dad now rest upon myself and Lewis along with the very much needed support of me mum, so we can take on these hard challenges ahead. Making this business a success, fulfilling my dad's dreams, will be his best memorial. Now, I never got to live out my ambition of being called Kevin Keegan Lowther. You can probably see why Jack was so significant to me dad. Nonetheless, I have a young nephew who's living, out, living that ambition out for us, the young Bobby Robson. As you leave the ceremony today, you see a box of donations by the door. Any donations in memory of me dad will go to friends of Gippside School in honour to Bobby Robson, who's attending here in September. Family was everything to me dad, so there is no worthy cause. After the ceremony, I would personally like to invite you all to the West End Club for refreshments in Winlayton. For those who don't know where it is, if you head for Lowther's Roundabout, <laughs> and then can strike up Bladen Bank. Now like I've always said, where we'll have music, we'll always have me dad. So let this last song be his last message to you. Thank you.
Here's to the ones that we got Cheers to the wish you were here but you're not Cause the drinks bring back all the memories Of everything we've been through Toast to the ones here today Toast to the ones that we lost on the way Cause the drinks bring back all the memories And the memories bring back, memories bring back you There's a time that I remember When I did not know no pain when I believed in forever And everything would stay the same Now my heart feel like December When somebody say your name Cause I can't reach out to call you But I know I will one day hey. Everybody hurts sometimes Everybody hurts someday hey, hey. Everything gonna be alright Go and raise a glass and say Here's to the ones that we got Cheers to the wish you were here, but you're not Cause the drinks bring back all the memories Of everything we've been through Toast to the ones here today Toast to the ones that we lost on the way Cause the drinks bring back all the memories And the memories bring back, memories bring back you do 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 The time that I remember When I never felt so lost When I felt all of the hatred Was too powerful to stop Now my heart feel like an ember And it's lighting up the dark I'll carry these torches for you That you know I'll never drop Everybody hurts sometimes Everybody hurts someday Everything will be Alright, go and raise a glass and say, hey Here's to the ones that we got Cheers to the wish you were here, but you're not Cause the drinks